Welcome everyone to our next uh, program element, which is also almost the last one of the day before the party that we start at 9 p.m., as you must know, in the Green Dragon's Lair. So, the next program is led by artist and immersive theatre director Melanie Dory, but she also has some invited guests on this panel, because this will be a panel discussion that will also at some point open towards you, so we count on you all. Uh, and the guests are, they will be introducing themselves, but let me just say their names. They are Fanny Lakos, Nandor Laklia, here you can find Melanie, David Basuk, and Nina Rune Essendrup. Enjoy. Thank you. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, so my name is uh, Melanie Esther Doré. So uh, I'm a French writer, director in immersive theater. Um, and my specialty is that I create a highly interactive immersive theatrical experiences. And um, I do study uh, LARP design and video game design, and I try to include that uh, in my work. And I guess that's why I'm here today <laughs> to talk about. Uh, yes, and I'm going to uh, pass the mic so uh, the other panelists can introduce themselves. Hi, nice to meet you. I'm Fanny Lakos, and I'm an actress from Hungary. And uh, I had also uh, luck to direct to pieces which were immersive uh, and I, I had no clue that it uh, it has the name immersive theater it was just totally intuitively that I made it like this it was a one to four so we we were four uh, actors and dancers in the piece and one uh, one audience uh, audience member uh, sorry for my English, I learned it by myself, so I will have problems with it as well. <laughs> I'm, I'm really an intuitive person. So, uh, and, and actually I also uh, uh, played in pieces, uh, immersive uh, theater pieces, uh, which were, for example, directed by Mate. <laughs> He's there. So, yeah, that's it. Excellent. My name is Nandor, Nandor Laklia from Budapest, Hungary. Um, this is a panel about uh, LARP and immersive theatre. I'm on the LARP side uh, of things. Uh, I uh, had a uh, NGO uh, in Budapest, Parallel Worlds, and also, uh, yeah, I'm one of the organizers of Portal. So, uh, yeah, and in this, I usually, in my professional life, I wear multiple hats. And LARP and immersive experiences is one of the hats that I'm, that I'm wearing. Uh, and with this, well, the connective tissue of, of the things that I do is about how to connect in games and stories. So no matter where my, my, my professional life leads, it's usually somehow connects to, to games and stories. And other than the game design hat, uh, the other hat that I'm wearing is tourism. So I, I lead tour groups and I design tour experiences. Uh, and again, we had a chance to work together on immersive theater, and it's like a like a um, the connection. I would say uh, we we created some kind of a, a hybrid uh, experience with which in between uh, theater and uh, and live action role playing. Hello, I'm David Basak. Um, yeah, I'm from the US. Um, so I'm a creator and a theater director. I'm also a producer. I work in um, many countries. I have a company in China where we do sort of large immersive activations with media companies. That's on one side of the world and of my work. The other side is much more intimate in theater productions and so specifically to the topic that we have, um, two years ago, I created a piece that was called The Pirandello Party, which was using uh, the premise, of sort of the LARP premise of a Pirandello Institute, which was a LARP. Um, and then at the, at the core of it was a theater piece using the Pirandello plays. And so there was an interaction between the audience, participant, players, a group of facilitating NPCs and a group of um, professional trained actors who were using the plays as we were using the personas in a hybrid experience. It was a test, but it also made me see that there's a space between these two 
ex types of experience design, theater and LARP, that is a very rich uh, interstitial space. Thank you. Hi. Uh, my name is Nina Rune Essendrup. Um, I've been a LARP designer for a very long time. And now I work as an artist with LARP as a media, uh, which means connecting LARP with dance or theater or performance arts or video arts. Um, I have a theoretical background in uh, dance and performance and theater. And relating to this subject specifically, <laughs> I've made LARPs for an audience. So a LARP where the LARPers play characters and are pulled a fiction, and then an audience who are not playing characters are invited to come in and join. Um, and have a way of interacting and meaningfully engage with the LAPAS experience to enhance kind of both their experience and the experience of the audience. And that has sometimes been framed at, as um, a sister theater. Thank you. And I was uh, lucky actually to be in one of your workshops for this when uh, we actually in 48 hours created a LARP in London uh, with, for an audience that was in theatrical form and we were LARPing within our roles. So <laughs> that, was, that was something. <laughs> um, so yes, today we're going to talk about the connections between LARP and immersive theater. And I was thinking to kick off the conversation, maybe to try to give a very broad definition of what is immersive theater, even though I think we're not going to get somewhere today to <laughs> like a precise definition. Um, uh, but basically, uh, maybe something to try to define it is that it's non-frontal theater. Um, and there's m there are many genres. Uh, there's promenade theater, exploration theater, game theater, dance theater, that have many forms, many forms. It doesn't have to be the, the one thing. Uh, some escape games have their theatrical elements in it. It's very broad, and um, this I think this discussion is very important and interesting to have because the two forms have more and more in common, and I think we have a lot to learn from one another. Um, and yes, so let's discuss it. Who would like to uh, start? Does someone, or someone has a question? Yeah. Um. Okay, so one thing I think is super interesting about combining lab and immersive theater uh, is kind of from the labbing perspective, it's super interesting to have a fiction that meets the real world, like that you in a very concrete way can have a fictional circumstance that people from our like normal real reality steps into, um, both for the labbers and, and like more conceptually, I think that's super interesting and has a lot of uh, interesting possibilities. I do. <laughs> um, so, I was talking about this earlier, this, the concept of being present. Okay, so one thing that is in common between theater and LARP is embracing the space between you and the other person. Um, in theater, it's between you and the other actor, but it's also between you and the audience who's watching, pulling that energy in, feeding that energy. So there is a cycle in a good production of theater. Uh, ultimately, if your seat is good enough and you're close enough, there is a wave, not unlike what happens in a concert, a music concert. Um, the, pre the, pre the presence of, the, the ability to have presence in a LARP is also possible and it's built with these layers of player and character. And the cause of the 360 of the environment, the cause of the ability to use space in such a unique way as you can in a LARP, the quality of the being present to the space, to the other performer, to the emerging narrative, to the LARP writers or designers' ideas, <laughs> means that the presence can be not limited to the, the electricity that's formed by a short presentation, like a theater piece, that is kind of artificial because of the relationship of the audience to the stage, but actually begins to feel more organic and lived, which is something that theater, in its greatest dreams, would try to have. But it can only have that in its rehearsals. 
Yeah, I, I'm, I'm going to uh, answer that. That's super interesting, the question of uh, presence. And uh, we talked about it yesterday uh, in uh, another panel, the difference between uh, acting and playing. Uh, as a player in a LARP or as an actor or a participant in an immersive piece. And uh, uh, there's a lot of differences and a lot of similarities, I think. Um, there's one is that when you're an actor in an immersive piece, you've been hired for the job. Um, and you have to do a performance that you're going to be judged on by peers and by spectators. So that's a bias, uh, of course, for your performance. Uh, so that's something to, ta to take account on. Whereas as a player, um, you also have pressure of playing with others, but I guess it's a different kind of pressure. Uh, and you don't have the same bias when you begin a play, and the play is in co-creation, whereas an, in an immersive play, you co-create with other actors, but you don't know how uh, the audience is going to be able to co-create with you or willing to co-create with you. So that's, uh, I think, a challenge uh, when you play uh, as an actor in an immersive play is how, where do you bring the point of intimacy and authenticity between audience and actors? I, just, I know that's an important thing for me um, because otherwise you bring back frontality uh, and you bring back the idea of the fourth wall in the performance. And how do you break that fourth wall where you have two different kinds of energies coming in uh, to create a moment where someone has been rehearsing a play for months and has been, you know, workshopping to be able to improv and to be able to, like, really play the play with uh, other people. Whereas uh, the audience that came in, just came in a couple minutes ago, never rehearsed the play, maybe they don't know a thing about it. So how do you create a design that allows that authenticity to happen and that specific authenticity you have in playing and co-creating together in, in LARP? For me, it's always very difficult to um, speak about what's happening between me as an actor and 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 the member who is in the piece, because it's uh, it's not about um, it's not about something what you can speak of. It's really just energy and and how open you how how you deep your open yourself in that situation as an actor as well. So I'm a touchy person, and I always use touch. So I I I know that a lot of people. Uh, don't like to be touched, and it's it's really difficult. But uh, a person who comes to a piece that that and they know that it's immersive, I think they are aware that something will happen, and so I can use it, and I always uh, look really deep in the eyes of the others. That's also you can you can somehow figure out how how is this person, how shy is it, how how. Um, how brave is it? Uh, uh, and with that, you, I mean, I, I, me as an act, I, I really just can talk about myself, but I always observe and I always try to figure out the psychology of this person. Maybe from time to time I'm wrong and that's, that's why I always have a red button. If it's too much, you can say it's red or something, I don't know, giraffe, and, uh, and then it's it's it stop stops uh, immediately, but uh, you told that we always um, live it differently, all the situations, and have it in uh, in a different uh, scenario in, in our minds, also in our souls, but but the unconscious in an unconscious way we are all connected. That's what I believe. And I try to connect to this unconscious uh, connection <laughs> in that moment, which is now a bit, I don't know, but for me works. Um, and I feel that I can do it like this. And, and actually it works for me, but I don't know if it works for you or for you. So it's just very subject, uh, sub subjective. Is there a word for this? Yes. It was, the question was about uh, defining uh, immersive theater. And again, I'm not a, I'm a lay person in theater. Uh, I've been designing, LARP, designing and LARP, uh, writing LARPs for quite a few years, but uh, yeah, I don't have training in theater. So I, uh, I'm probably going to use 
LARP terms or layperson's terms in this case, but uh, for me, um, it's about uh, it's uh, what makes sense for me as a metaphor is deciding scale based on participation, what is required from the audience, and what do you call your audience. Um, and again, if it's participative theater, then you know you, some kind of participation is expected from the audience to take place during the uh, during the uh, the play. Immersive, I'm not sure. Uh, is there participation meant in immersive? Can you uh, can you be a spectator when you're in an immersive theater play, or you do or do you expect it to to uh, to to, to participate, or there is, or maybe there are avenues for you that uh, that are being designed that you you know you may uh, hook on to uh, um, to something uh, and engage with an actor, and that's the other thing. Um, if if I see if I hear the third members of theater. Uh, yeah, that must be. There, it must be that they, they'll have actors there, right? And there, there's going to be a director directing the play. So there's some kind of intentionality um, behind it. Again, LARPs also have a, an intentional design, but uh, um, but no, it's not intended to uh, to be produced or in that sense, uh, like a theater production or an immersive theater production is 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 is, is, is created, I guess. Um, and the other main difference that was really interesting with our work together uh, on um, on the Bronze Age Village uh, immersive uh, adventure, uh, theatrical adventure project was that uh, uh, we actually had a, um, a, a, a rehearsal process, uh, which usually doesn't happen to LARPs, right? Uh, LARPs get to see uh, the daylight they run, and even the, even it's a, if it's a, re, a rerun for a, for a LARP, uh, that's the first time for the player um, to play that that character, and um, they um, so again uh, it was fascinating to uh, to actually be present and and and, and prepare for the uh, the experience in a sense that uh, with with a with an ex with a um, we 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 are a process. So that's that's basically the uh, the other thing that I would would, would point out as say something that is, mm, yeah, part of an in, in immersive uh, production, maybe a theater production. Um, talking about uh, design and the similarities and the differences, uh, there's this concept of um, uh, the emotion palette that I really like that I found in a real right masterclass. Real right is the creator of The Sims. Um, and so I think it's from him, or he was quoting, I don't remember, but <laughs> anyways, uh, that the emotional palette of a traditional theater uh, would be something like um, sadness, joy, love, things like that, things that are very frontal and that you are receptive with, whereas in a game, but I think that applies to LARP and immersive theater, the uh, emotional palette is different, where it would be something like pride, shame, and guilt, because you've participated in it and you, you are engaged in it. And I think that's very uh, interesting in the way either you design something, uh, whereas you're uh, a director, an actor, or an uh, NPC, or any way, because I think uh, in an, uh, any kind of immersive experience, whether it's theater or LARP, we are all our own mini directors in the moment, because uh, you know you cannot just have a frontal direction because there's going to be a lot of um, uh, unpredictability, and that's the beauty of it. <laughs> so we're all directing ourselves in the moment all the time, constantly, you know? And having that in mind for ourselves and for others, I think, is creating something that's uh, very strong uh, for the actors, for the players, or for the participants, you know? And that blurs kind of uh, the boundaries between all these roles and uh, maybe something that I find beautiful is that all these roles are fading when we are arriving to a point of uh, intimacy and authenticity all together, you know? And that sometimes, maybe something that you say, some decisions are unconscious, is that maybe at one point you're not thinking like an actor anymore. You're just acting from a person to another person, you know? I actually, when I... I, I play in a very traditional role, I also do it like this. So I, I'm not a typical actor in, a, in that way, I think. So I'm always in the moment, and I always try to 
do something new. Also when it's written, you know, it's it's because it's the moment and, and, and the character doesn't feel always the same with, with, with the same sentences. It's always different. So if you let it open for yourself, it's it doesn't matter if you're an actor or, or um, me, <laughs> you know, it's um, you can connect. And I think the other one, what is really important by an immersive piece or a LARP, that before you begin, you have to build up trust and 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 empathy between uh, all the members. Doesn't matter which side or there is there are no sides anymore. Yeah. So I, I want to crawl inside of the word immersive for a second because it's like. It's a word we all have a different meaning for. Um, and I don't think it's a useless word, like some people just want to find another word. But I feel like it's usable, but it's usable on a dial, like on a scale. So reading a book or watching a television show certainly can be immersive. We have all guilty of being immersed in what is a passive, because we weren't physically active, medium. We were not physically active, but we were mentally immersed, engaged. We were soaking in the content, right? And we, it lived in us. And how can we not say that that was immersive? So that it can be immersive, not always. You know, reading a lot of textbooks, not very immersive. In fact, you have to work hard to get your brain into any state where you can actually give it the, the generosity to call it engaging, even. Um, and then there's interactive, like museums are terrible at this, <laughs> right? So look at this screen, punch that. That's what it looked like 100 years ago. Like, what did we just go to a museum in uh, Salzburg, the fortress? And it was like this interactive exhibit. And I was like, I'm going. But in fact, it was just like, oh, and it said something, and it said something. <laughs> and like, you could see something. So that level of interactivity is probably should be considered by age. Science museums are often calling them assemblies. Oh, the word immersive is like the hottest word for marketers, right? But they're promising usually interaction at most. They're, they're promising interaction. And interaction is not participatory because it's defined. It's like a game that's a puzzle there's no agency, you just have to know what they designed because it's a puzzle, right? And interactivity is the similarly non-immersive as puzzles are. I'm sorry to puzzle makers. Um, so <laughs> then the next level of immersion on the dial would be participatory. To what degree participatory? That's also got a little mini scale within it from floater, swimmer, to larper, to quote uh, uh, Nadja Lipsick, who I first put these words in my mind. Um, so floater, swimmer, diver, these are levels of participation, or in game design what they call killers, who like really get so into it. But still, it's not the highest point on the dial. For me, that is co-creation. So once the immersion gets to the point where the player or the reader, or the theater visitor, or the, has some, not just agency, but is actually building in the branch, or building extensions of it, or taking it and doing their own. And sometimes some passive mediums like Star Wars created all this fan fiction. And, you know, and even the term fan and fan fiction are equally derogatory, but it actually implies that there was a joy of co-creation made possible by a story world that was at first emotionally immersive and that leapt into the desire for adaptation or fan art or fan fiction. So to get to that level of co-creation is a higher level of immersion. But all the way back to watching or reading the book, they're all valuable if you consider it on a dial instead of as like a category. I have a funny anecdote on that. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know if you know uh, the Punch Drunk Theatre Company. Mm -hmm. 
that's doing Sleep No More, which is the biggest immersive theater company right now. And so their play Sleep No More has been playing its uh, reinterpretation of Macbeth in New York that has been playing for over 12 years now, I think. Uh, it's huge. Uh, it's this huge experience for, for, for 400 persons at night on like six floors uh, in New York. And it's... China. And also in Shanghai, also, and they have the Burn City in London right now. Yeah, it's a huge show. It's it's very it's very beautiful. Um, and anyway, so they have a lot of fans, and the fandom. And what I learned is that the artistic director of Punch Drunk doesn't like the fans. <laughs> Why? Because they are LARPing <laughs> in the show, <laughs> and this actual thing where they form groups, and they are going to the show. Uh, which is very expensive, so they, they're like even saving money to go to the show several times per month. Uh, I think it's the show is between 100 to 150 dollars to get in, so it's very expensive. Uh, and so they get in as groups and they have these costumes and they created these branching narratives that doesn't exist, you know, <laughs> in the show. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. And. And it went so far that actual spectators thought they were characters in the show. <laughs> I mean, I think we had kind of a similar experience with that. We essentially, so the, 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 the theatrical adventure that I keep repeating or keep mentioning is that uh, essentially we had uh, three actors involved in the, uh, in, in, in the creation of the well, in, in this project, and uh, six LARPers, LARPer roles. Uh, and at the end of the, uh, the the play, they usually the the audience members they could not differentiate who was uh, who was an actor. Or sometimes it, it was like, okay, you were also an actor in this, uh, even though some they, they just basically signed up as a player, uh, and had a one hour workshop before the uh, the, the the experience. So uh, yeah, just to add on the anecdotes. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I think there's also something really interesting here about expectations. Um, like in relation to real life situations, uh, going into an immersive theater piece, even if I'm allowed to co-create, I still have the idea that someone there is doing a designed experience or having some idea of what I'm about to experience. So even if I'm not, if I don't know who are the actors and who are not, I'm gonna interpret extra meaning into everything everybody does, because in the context it might be part of the experience, so I can uh, perceive it as such. Um, or the other way around, uh, when we've done the labs with an audience, I think it makes a big difference that the audience know that this is improvised, and that this is not something bop, 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 rehearsed, but that everything's happening in the moment. Um, yeah, well, that changes the situation a lot. I actually had a question for you on that. Um, if you had to define the different challenges for creating a LARP just for players and creating a LARP with an audience, what would be the different challenges for you? Um, I think um, <laughs> um, the big thing like one of the big things is to make a design that is simultaneously relevant um, for the audience and the lapers. So they're kind of existing in two different realities, like the normal realities for the audience and the designed realities for the lapers. And the meeting between those two should be designed in a way that it enhances the experience for both groups. So if I design for lapers, I only have to care about one kind of experience, and if it's for lapers and audience, it has to be designed for both. And I imagine also in connection to making a theater piece, um, when designing a lab with an audience, it's also super important that it is a lab. So the lapping experience is relevant and interesting as much as a lapping experience for lapers. So they're, they're not becoming actors or um, like performing for others, but they're upholding their own will for their own sake and then inviting others to join. Um, so, when I, the, the piece that I described earlier, the Pirandello party, um, 
one of the people who mentored me was Nina. So, because I knew, so I knew she had done this like LARP plus spectator. So I thought, okay, how does this work? And it was so helpful. Um, Nina and I have known each other for years, but on Zoom until only recently, we now know that we exist in the corporeal sense. Um, so, but, and I've actually done LARPs with Nina on Zoom. So it was a privilege that you cannot imagine that Zoom could be so interesting and so physical. And my computer has still got the smudges from what. <laughs> um, so, but the LARP theater hybrid or attached like spectator plus LARP was interesting because it, I mean, I, it was certainly, I think, interesting for the audience members who, I mean, that's not the right word, the people who came to be audience members and actually left with a persona that they chose and a name that they created and conversations among the spectators, audience members, participants. Um, the words don't catch up, even if you're a native English speaker, we don't have the words for this. Um, so, the rela the, you know, most people go to a theater piece, and this might be the real difference, I've got it, between theater and immersive. Um, you go to a theater piece, and you meet no one, and you leave with no one in your life that's new. Now, you look at some of these old theaters, these old opera houses, and if you look at the schedule of when they, how they performed, they sometimes had intermissions that were an hour, right? Why would you have an intermission that was an hour? Of course they would, because it was about the socializing amongst the audience. Why would plays have two intermissions? Were they not impatient to get home and watch the television? Well, they didn't, right? So they didn't live in isolated world with screens. So socializing was actually always part of the theater experience. Look at the buildings that remain from the 19th century and the early 20th century. These were social spaces where there were also performances. Secret cinema, in fact, has kind of reinvented this with you know, sort of an immersive theater wrapped around a movie. And like, so that concept is actually not new, it's old. And currently, the particular people who work in theater have not designed for the audience to meet, to mingle, to socialize. And isn't it interesting, at the same moment that the people who are running the theater, the professional theaters, have decided that it's about the work on stage, at that same moment, theaters begin to lose their audiences and attention in the culture. Because they lost attention about society, right? Oh, the alternate reality of society on the stage, but not the people who come in. Um, had a theater company, we had a theater company in Philadelphia um, called Novel Stages. We were about adaptations and about bringing people into larger types of narrative story worlds. And to my deepest regret, I never really met the audience. We had subscribers. You know, we had some very like amazing people. We had this amazing architect, Kevin Bacon's father, who was like a major architect in Philadelphia. It was a regular, he'd come and I, we were always like, it's Kevin Bacon's father. But it was like, but we never put him on stage. We never allowed him into the process. We never gave our audience the ability to participate in this mind of his because essentially, trained in theater the way I was, that was not what we do in the theater. What, what, what are we, community theater? Like, like the, in theater, there's a, yes, there's really a, an elitism in the theater. It's true, I can tell you, it's a fact. Um, but it's not, it's not to the good of theater. It's actually the beginning of its decline. And actually thinking about participation and socializing and building the audience as a community, and that's not a bad word, theater people, right? if that can actually happen effectively in design, it can actually restore theater's place as part of society mm -hmm. and part of our need to go out at night, right? Because we don't need to go out at night to see great people do great things over there. <laughs> Some of us like that, but it's like, it's not a, it's not a big thing, right? Yeah. Um, 
I want to rebound on that, mm -hmm. um, the, about the expectations people have when they go into an experience. Yeah. And I guess people who go into a LARP have different expectations than people who go into an immersive theater play. Mm -hmm. And within the immersive theater, uh, there's many currents that are different. And one of the uh, inspirational currents of immersive theater is the theater of the oppressed, that is very social. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with the theater of the oppressed. Um, yes, cool. Um, so, and right now there's this other current that is very commercial in the immersive theater world. Uh, that's very understandable with the world we live in, of course. Um, but I see personally there's a huge difference in the crowds, uh, whereas um, some people would go into an immersive experience to have a human experience and a transformative experience as some other people would go to consume like a cultural piece and they want to be entertained and uh, they just want the maximum interaction because that's the next big thing to have, you know? That's the cool thing. And I think as, a des as designers and actors and artists, there's all these expectations to take in that are very different and that can be very confusing because uh, some people will be disappointed if you do like uh, uh, a progressive and uh, social play and they were like, what is this? Uh, where are the drinks and the bands? <laughs> and, uh, and yes, and there's all of that. And there's the economics also of theater that making it uh, sometimes complicated to, to deal with those expectations. Yeah.